I feel nauseous, believe me. Never had a lot of sh come easy. Had to work hard, struggle just to be me. Had to work hard, what was left over I put towards my dreaming But the only thing in life that has meaning Are the things you gotta work for, believe me Take into your hands a plan Your own hands can land your own brand And damn, I feel like no one takes accountability They want the credibility Convincingly unwilling to put in the f hours It takes to get some power Don't be f***ing sour Take a cold shower Scream until you're louder Work until you're prouder And f*** all the doubters They're just your downers I swear to God they all let me down I always find I can tell you that Seven years after Freddie Gray that was 2015, spring, April, May. This is 2022. Communities like Sandtown all we saw then and now in terms of investment was a renovated Western District Police Station and a new funeral home. That's what West Baltimore got. A new police station and a new funeral home. What kind of optics are they? Was, was Freddie Gray any different than 1968 Baltimore riots? Dr. King's passing, killing, murder? Is it the same? Uh, no, it wasn't. I, mean, I, I, I think, well, first of all, people who are, are doing uh, violent and burning, is, 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 that's, you know, all that's the same. Uh, but the point is, is what was the cause and what were they attempting to register? Good morning. This is the Friday, September 23rd edition of the Donnie Glover Show. I hope you had a good week. I sure did. Praise the Lord. We all made it through, so we all have a lot to be thankful for. So, I don't do this enough, but I need to plug my book, I Am Black Wall Street, tells a story. This came out last year during the centennial, and it tells a story. There are a lot of stories out there about Black Wall Street, but I wanted to tell the story of how those people first got to Oklahoma. Who in their right mind will go out there to Indian territory in the early 1800s? Were they on a the trail of tears? They were. Were they slaves? They were not. Are the history books wrong? Many of them are. And that's why you got to get my book, I Am Black Wall Street, to get the rest of the story. What did John Brown have to do with Oklahoma? What did Captain John Brown, whose raid on Hoppers Fire, Virginia, what did that have to do with Oklahoma? But you're going to read about it in my book. And this is my first book. This came out in 2015. And no, that's not the penitentiary. That's the White House. Okay, that was a joke. Somebody asked me what was that building behind it. It's the White House. And yes, we do cover the White House. We've covered the White House since 2010. Uh, we, we've been several times, at least uh, 50 times. And we've sent people along the way other journalists, and members of the Be More News family. So today we're going to talk about some beautiful Black history in our own hometown. This young man, let me just tell you, what I love about him is his consistency, his diligence, and his ability to find information 
that very few others have. Now, before we get rolling, I must say I want to dedicate this show to uh, my late dear friend, Tom Smith. Is that all right with you, uh, Philip? Can we dedicate this show to Tom? To Tom? I said Tom Smith. To What's Tom's last name? Smith. No, no, no. Oh, Harry Wilson. Harry Wilson. No, the, the local Tom. Who used to do the tours? Oh, 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 um, oh my gosh! Uh, with Renaissance Productions. Yeah. I can't think of his last name. He died. Sure. I can't think of his name. Tom's name escaped me. He would kick me in the butt. I know, but he's gonna smack you in your big head. <laughs> but before and there, he go. He he come out the gate swinging. You gotta see. I don't warned you, Baltimore. This is an official Baltimore cat. The Tom used to be with Lou Field. Well, in that same general. Uh, form of, I can't believe I forgot his last name. Tom Saunders. Saunders, oh, yes, there you, go. there you go. Forgive me, Tom Saunders. But Tom used to share the most fascinating information about Baltimore. Philip Merrill, welcome to the show. You've been, I mean, you are Baltimore Black history. You, you, <laughs> I mean, literally, you are Baltimore Black history. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't live in Baltimore, but Baltimore lives in me. How, how do you like that? Oh, you spend time here. You certified. <laughs> yes, indeed, I am. I am. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. So tell them what you do. Okay. Uh, I'm the CEO founder of a LLC named after my late great grandmother, Gertrude Jackson. Her nickname was Nanny Jack. She was a midwife in historic Sandtown in Old West Baltimore. Uh, one person that's still alive that I know of that she brought into the world is Elder Harris. Really? Uh, which is just showing you how much small to more is six degrees of separation. Uh, and we are a heritage consulting firm that uh, curate exhibits. We lecture around the country. We are TV personality. Uh, we write books. We have a podcast. Uh, we find ways to lift up the legacy of people that came before us through material culture, oral history, and uh, deep dive of quality research to connect the dots. All right, so if you're from Baltimore, I highly suggest you get an ink pen. If you want to get some information, you quite likely have never heard before. Now, this gentleman is a certified researcher. You got people that go around and claim that they are researchers. Right. <laughs> they claim that they have history books. <clears throat> But they haven't done the research, and part of our theme song has to deal with doing the work. You got to get out there and do the work. Nobody's going to do it for you. Right. And so, Philip, it is my understanding that people consult you from around the world Yes. when they want to be accurate yes. about Baltimore history. So can you share with us a surprising fact or two? just to get the, the ball rolling. I, I most certainly can. Um, we are so proud to be a leading consultant on a new documentary. Uh, the documentary is called uh, Moonchild, The Life and Music of Youssef Selim. Now, only some old cats like uh, Primetime Gary Ellaby uh, and some other folks uh, may have heard of uh, and Reverend Avon Bellamy, nicknamed Reds, may have known or heard of Joe Blair, his former name before he became a Muslim. This young gentleman uh, went to St. Peter Claver. This young gentleman went to uh, Douglas High School. I'm on the air. He, he did not graduate because he started playing professionally at the Royal Theater on Pennsylvania Avenue. His career blasted off and he went into the military and uh, fell onto some hard times but rebounded and ended up being a superstar in Durham, North Carolina. So we've been brought to the table with uh, filmmaker Kenny Dalshimer, who was originally from Baltimore, uh, who is going to lift up the legacy of this outstanding jazz pianist that we need to know about. And what's his name? Youssef Salim. He was a pianist? Yes, a bad man, bad to the bone. You need to Google, you need to Google Youssef Salim or go to the site for Moonchild, The Life and Music of Youssef, Youssef Salim. It's a fiscal sponsor, it's the Southern Documentary Fund. So this is a serious project that we've been doing a deep dive on 
trying to uncover unbelievable bits of history, connecting to a sense of place, uh, time. And then the most difficult thing is to find original photographs. How does that work? <laughs> well, that works when you have a network, when you can send an email to uh, the Center for Maryland History and Culture. You could talk to the uh, Afro Archivist. You could talk to the Maryland State Archives. Um, who, who is the Afro Archivist? Uh, Dion Moses is her name. It's a woman. Yes. Yes. With all due respect. Yes. You, 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 you really have to rely on your network. Because we've been riding this horse for 30 years, we know people that know people that are in different spaces that can open the door that are willing to research. UMBC has played a role in helping us, the Maryland State of Corrections. So we've been trying to, uh, Peabody uh, Music uh, Conservatory in the archives, we've been trying to come up with um, vernacular, which is amateur photography, as well as commercial photography, to add some authenticity to this powerful narrative of a self-taught pianist that blows up and has a remarkable career and most Baltimoreans don't know his name. So you mentioned Durham. Yes. A lot of people don't know the significance of Durham. I'm sure you do. Oh, well, first of all, I, now that I'm in the Queen City, you know, I left the Monumental City to move to the Queen City, which is Charlotte, North Carolina. Durham, and I, I'm learning to say Durham, okay, because I'm, a East, I'm, from West, I'm from Baltimore, so I want to say Durham, but it's Durham, okay? Durham had the Haytide Black Like community. Mississippi. Right, like Miss exactly. So the Haytai was a uh, all inclusive uh, black community that unfortunately was wiped out. Uh, so again, it ties into your Black Wall Street. And one of the things that I'm excited, you know, Durham. About, I'm sorry, Durham was wiped out. Well, not Durham, but the the Haytai, the the population of this black community was wiped out. Okay, well, so see, I, I thought you were gonna. I was trying to lead you down the road where. Durham was an official Black Wall Street, one of three. Okay, well, well, I, I didn't take the I didn't take the bait. You know, sometimes when when people are fishing, you don't always take the bait, right? <laughs> but I know. Durham, Richmond, and Tulsa; those are the three official. Okay, and Richmond, which we have Black an extensive Wall. archive from, is known as the Harlem of the South, and especially if you look at Jackson Ward. Um, of and course. We can, and we That's can tell what Maggie was right when we can talk about that in another show because we have an extensive archive of rare material culture from uh Richmond where we've been researching for 20 years. But I want to put in a plug, um, Donnie, for you, please. Uh, the last time I saw your mug was uh in 2016. <laughs> and what does it say? Black Wall Street, EDAC, Morgan State University, 2016, when I was uh, elected to the Joe Mann Black Wall Street with this award. Okay, so it's been six years since I've talked with you. Aren't I do a check? Uh, no. no, I'm doing it. I should be getting paid to get up this early to come on your show. Let me drop. Let me drop some more knowledge for you, Todd, into this um, whole theme of uh, Black Wall Street and Pioneer. Have you ever done stand-up comedy? Uh, I do it at my house every day. I I, I I live with four other women, and every day it's a comedy show. Okay. Okay. Um, you dedicated this to uh, Tom Saunders. I want to dedicate this to uh, a gentleman by the name of Frederick I. Scott Jr. Frederick who? I. Scott. Spell I. How you spell I? Yeah, it's like Isidori. I. Oh, oh, that's an initial. Yeah, initial. Um, okay, Frederick I. Scott. My presentation to him because tomorrow at Johns Hopkins University, they're they are honoring his legacy by dedicating a building and naming it the Scott Tower. Now, when you're deep in Baltimore history, like Nanny Jack and Company LLC is, you know this kind of material and you have a special invitation to tomorrow's celebration, okay? Now, let me drop some real knowledge on you. He graduated from Douglas High School at Calhoun Carey and Baker Street. In that Frederick is Douglas' stuff, I've seen it. My daddy had one, hold that back up, Douglas okay. Douglas. Okay, but wait a minute. Okay, okay, but I ain't talking about I ain't talking about your daddy right now. I'm talking about Frederick I. Scott uh, Jr. Okay, I've it's, seen that material before. I saw that before. Okay, well, we have one of the more extensive collections in the country of Douglas High School, uh, starting off when it was a colored high school. Okay, with photographs, letters, jewelry, diplomas, textbooks, homework assignments, you name it, we got. It. But what I, what I'm holding is Frederick Scott's yearbook. Okay. 1945 February. A lot of people don't know that Douglas, like many schools during Jim Crow, 
had mid-year graduations. Some folks are just familiar with the June graduation, but you need to be aware of the February one. And this is the original commencement program where Frederick I. Scott Jr. is an honor student at Douglas. He is being recognized for being the first African-American student to graduate from Johns Hopkins University. D. I know who is this? <laughs> Frederick I. Scott. Frederick I. Scott, really? He was an engineer and he came out in the class of 1950 from the Johns Hopkins University. From 1950? Yes, but let's keep moving, okay? Because I got a lot of stuff for well, you. That sounds a little late. Uh, I'm sorry? So, you saying he was the first black at Hopkins? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so slow down, pimp. <laughs> W.B. Du Bois was yes. at Harvard 50 years prior. Right, but when Are I talk telling me that Johns Hopkins didn't take the first black till a half century later than than the more elite colleges, the Ivy League schools? Okay, yes and no. Kelly Miller matriculated there but did not graduate. Is that a man or a woman? It's a man. Kelly Miller was the dean at Howard, which is known as the Black Harvard. Okay, in DC. He was the do dean before Charles Hamilton Houston. Yeah, Charles Hamilton Houston comes along later, bro. You, you, I, I appreciate you throwing out these names because they get me excited, but the chronology, the chronology is a little bit off. Yes, he was there before Charles Hamilton Houston. So the, so the question is, Johns Hopkins has been a racist institution towards black people. If they just started accepting black people in 1950, and W.B. Du Bois was one of the first blacks to get a Ph.D. from Harvard in, in the 1800s, the Johns Hopkins racist is all outdoors. They got a lot of reparations to be making to the black community. I mean, first it was uh, Vivian Thomas, who should be Dr. Vivian Thomas, MD. With the blue lock, ba with, the, with the blue baby. Then, and Dr. then it's the money they, they, they made off of Henrietta Lacks' right. dealer cells, but Ben Crump won't collect on some of that. Right, but let's go, let's go to something else that people don't talk about a lot. Reverend Dr. William Monker Alexander from Sharon Baptist Church in Old West Baltimore uh, died um, tied into some questionable issues of receiving medical service at Hopkins when his doctor called in advance for him to be uh, admitted. And that wouldn't be the first time a white institution, a white medical institution has assassinated a black man, and not just in America, I'm thinking of the African presidents who died under the hands of white surgeons in Europe. Right. See, so again, history often repeats itself. And uh, to, to quote George Clinton, um, not new to it, but true to it. OK. All right. So let, let me let me keep this ball moving. I don't want to talk about Hopkins too much, but today is the. This, ain't just, yo, this is my show. Stop running things. <laughs> I got the first punch in. Hey, folks. But, but wait, wait, really but I'm a young things. Cassius Clay because I float like a butterfly and sting like a bee, oh, all right? Lord. Oh, Lord. Okay. Folks, we have with us the one and only <laughs> Philip Merrill. And I want to send a special thank you to his family for all of the therapy that they never got. I want <laughs> you to know that Ben Crump can get you a class action lawsuit. You can be compensated. <laughs> No, Philip Merrill, uh, we it. should thank Diane Bell McCoy for all she did to make sure this segment happened. So thank you for joining us. I'll shut up. Okay, so um, another important name connected to uh, Baltimore is E. Franklin Frazier. I've heard of him. Was he a preacher? No, bro, man. Come on, man. I know this is your show, so I can't swim too hard. Historian? Uh, no, he's a sociologist. Well, you just go throwing out names that sound like I knew him. Sound like but, the dude around the corner, E. Franklin. No, okay. You know him because of his seminal book, The Black Bourgeoisie. Okay. That's what I know. Him but more importantly, he graduated from the Colored High School in Old West Baltimore when it was at Dolphin and Pennsylvania Avenue. He the graduated old, from what? The Old Colored High, colored high School the precursor to Douglas when it was located at Dolphin and Pennsylvania Avenue. But but quickly, what I'm trying to say is that he had such disdain for Hopkins because of their, their uh, racist ideologies that when he would go by the campus, he would spit at it. Okay, now 
E. Franklin Frazier is most famous for being connected to Howard University. Um, but he also did a seminal book on the Negro families in Chicago. Uh, and uh, his story is phenomenal, but he gets his start like so many other prominent people do on the sacred grounds of Old West Baltimore. And we don't often get that kind of national publicity when they're working on these gigantic iconic figures. They normally talk about where they go to college, you know, what they do post-graduation uh, and so forth. But I'm always trying to bang the drum to say, hey, the foundation in Baltimore made him so he could go on to become this prominent sociologist. And, and that's where the disconnect comes on a local, regional, national, international level. So you're saying the world always wants our gems from Baltimore. Correct. But they never want to give Baltimore the credit due. Right. And so I, I spent my last 30 years of my adult life trying to do that. And next year, um, I'm going to be pumping this book that we did 20 years ago. A Black Man from Baltimore, Booker T. Washington in the house, Douglas High School in the house, Lincoln University in the house, was the regimental photographer that went to Alaska in 60 below zero temperature as an engineer to build the Alcan Highway known as the Alaska Military Highway, okay? William- Those were black people working up in there. 60 below zero temperature. We did this book in 2022, I'm sorry, in 22, I can't even talk, my gosh, in 2002, 20 years ago, which was the 60th anniversary of these powerful black men going to Alaska, risking all odds to build this important military highway. This is a very significant engineering feat. The man I interviewed for a whole year was a regiment. That book. Okay, well, but if you look closely, you'll see your boy's name on it, okay? University of Mississippi Press did this, and we're going to do a thing next year for the 20th anniversary. And I'm not, not next year, in October, next month, for the 20th anniversary of this book coming out. Mr. Griggs was a walking history book from Old West Baltimore. He was a salutatorian at Booker T and at Douglas, and a woman beat him out both times. A woman beat Mr. Griggs out both times. Uh, and Be Beat him out for what? for being the valedictorian of Booker T and at Douglas, the same woman. And uh, the, the the late judge, William Murphy Sr. was one of his best friends. And it was so fabulous to hear the oral history where he would run around uh, to uh, Murphy's house uh, where they opened up Christmas presents together. See, so oral history plays a big role in helping to share the intimate stories that you can get from census work, from looking at the Sanborn maps, from looking at deeds and, and directories. It just adds another layer or some flavor to some of these uh, under known stories. What should Baltimoreans know about our history? Well, really what we should know is that you, you can't look at where it is today. You can't look at the demolitions that take place, the eminent domain, the crime, uh, the vacant buildings. You need to dig deeper to look at who actually walked on those streets that hallowed ground decades before that were important. And I want—I got to put a plug in for something, Donnie, while I got you here quickly. Um, everybody's trying to secure the bag, okay? And a lot of the uh, people talk about getting the bag. And that, that means getting cash for the folks who don't know. This is from a black bank that you rarely hear about. Druid Hill Avenue? No, North Druid. Avenue. West, huh? North Avenue. West North Avenue. Advanced Federal Savings and Loan. In the junction? No, not in the junction, not that far down. This man in the early 50s set up a black bank that could help finance black churches and went on to expand for decades and just within the last five years merged with another bank in Baltimore's history. But the point is, where was it? I'm sorry? Where was it? On West North Avenue. They also had one on the Alameda, right okay, by Morgan. 40 blocks. How, what block? I don't have it committed to memory, bro. I can give it to you next time. I'll look at my notes, but I've this, seen it. See, I was thinking ideal. Ideal was on Druid Hill. Right, but I'm not talking about ideal. Ideal I'm clear. <laughs> okay, but you can't tell me what see as folks, this is where the fight broke out. Okay, go ahead, bully. I'm gonna let you be the bully today. No, no, it's your show, bro. And, it's your and show. Your man Michael Haney is saying hello to you. He, he he's up in your nosebleed section, by the way. Okay, all right. Hello, hello, hello back. But but time out a minute. No, no, no. I, 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 okay, since you want to go there, this is the bank that I'm really in love with. Okay. Can you see it? The man that created the Mutual Benefit Society's name is Harry O. Wilson. 
Harriet well, Wilson. First, first, slow down, slow down. We don't know. Today, we we don't know what a mutual benefit society was. And I, and I, I, I pose that. I, I put a little stopper in the conversation right there because Maggie Walker was affiliated with a similar institution. What is a mutual society? How were these quote unquote societies? Uh, why did we have them? And okay. I mean, the answer is obvious, but how did they come about? Okay, due to um, discrimination, due to disenfranchisement, due to the need for sick and health and death benefits, for people of African descent, these type of organizations were de rigueur, came into, came into being. Maggie Lena Walker's one was called the St. Luke's Penny um, Mutual Benefit uh, uh, Group. And she also had a bank with the same name, okay? Um, and, and it had roots here. Yes, because she's picking up the, the slack from a very early Bethelite. When I say Bethelite, I'm talking about Bethel AME. Uh, a lady by, had the last name of Prout, P-R-O-U-T, who had it first. When Prout dies, uh, goes on to the next leg of her uh, journey, Maggie Lena Walker picks it up and it, it goes to a whole nother iteration in Richmond, Virginia. And they even had branches of this uh, St. Luke's group in Baltimore because we have original deeds um, from people that had brought into Maggie Lena Walker's um, St. Luke's Penny's uh, benefit group. So I want well, that well, to I'm sorry, go ahead. So let's go to the question. I'm what sorry. Is, what is the Mutual Benefit Society? The one in Baltimore was founded in 1903 by Harry O. Wilson. The same Harry O. Wilson that Historic Wilson Park is named after off of York Road by the Alameda by Cold Spring. Okay. This man was a clear entrepreneur, visionary, ahead of his time, and a philanthropist. Out of, out of setting up this insurance company, that by the way, that employed generations of people of African descent, um, you got sick and death and health benefits. And again, if you think about it today, if you are of a certain age, you remember the insurance man coming to your house in East Baltimore and West Baltimore. In some cases, he was strapped with a gun to pick up the weekly payments for your insurance. And what you all- wasn't stupid. Okay, right, cut it out. And what you also realize is when your relatives- and they had cash, I mean- Right, you know. right, right. And when your relatives died, you also realize that some of these benefits didn't cover the funeral, but that's another story for another conversation. But Harry O. Wilson's group was successful for generations and he ended up establishing his own African-American owned and operated bank. Okay? I feel so stupid. It was a burial society. It was a, a, a way of taking care. Not that we don't need one today. Right, but that's what I said with sick and death and benefits. So let's go back for a minute. Harriet Wilson was going against the odds because there weren't a lot of black banks up and running when he set his up. And during the depression, when some <laughs> white banks crashed, he was still sovereign. He was still good because okay. he had that kind of business acumen to be able to not um, upset or, or have his uh, customers lose their money. Okay, so where did he get his money? He made his money from the Mutual Benefit Society that he established years earlier in 1903. So he and, had an insurance thing going on. Willie Adam had the numbers. He had the insurance thing. Right. And But with this insurance, it's for sick, it's for health and death benefits. Okay. And he also purchased over a thousand acres of land in Wilson Park to create a microcosm of black America where these homes were built for black people and they were detached. They were not the typical row homes that most people associate urban Baltimore with. These were detached homes. And, and why did he build this black suburban garden community? Well, it, it was a, it, a, it was a, a financial opportunity for See, him. You're supposed to come back and say because Roland Park had one, because the white people had one. Well, well yeah, to me, okay. See, because I live in that world, that's the obvious. Okay, but I'm, I forget, I'm talking to you and your audience, so no, no slight, no slight here. All I'm what just trying to say, say, what, 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 what are you saying? I'm saying that. Where, where are you right now? I need to send an Uber over there for you. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh. 
I got, I, I'm going to tell you what kind of weapon we have. Um, unfortunately, I live so deeply in this world that I forget sometimes that I have to slow it down and peel back the layers of the onion to allow everybody to understand what I'm talking about. Harriet Wilson was a true entrepreneur who was seized, carpe diem, seizing the moment, okay? So it was very difficult for Blacks to get property during the time that he established Wilson Park. At the same time, Morgan Park was being established. So you got two pioneering black communities. Where's Morgan Park? Adjacent to historic Morgan State University, the National Treasure out Hill and Road. So there are three historic black communities out there. Hose Heights, Morgan right. Park, Wilson Park. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. And, and I told you that Hose Heights is currently being leaned on by the Friends of Roland Park, which includes a woman who works for the Abel Foundation, and they pretty much told them, Black people, we don't give a damn about your 100 years of history. Kick rocks. Right. Well, okay, so the kick rock phenomenon is nothing new to us, right? So when I was a CHAP commissioner, Commission for Historical Architecture Preservation, appointed by Mayor O'Malley and City Council President Jack yeah, Young. Yeah. Hey, slow down. Where are you running to? <laughs> when I was a CHAP commissioner, appointed by Mayor O'Malley and City Council President Jack Young, I was appointed as a historian and I worked diligently to try to get the community of Wilson Park designated as a historic district. We failed. I could not pull it off. Now, 15 years later, the neighborhood does not look the same and it won't ever look the same, but we were able to get Harry o. Wilson's house landmark. So Harry o. Wilson's house is designated thanks to Henneshenna Hayes and the late Mabel Smith who were pioneering members that worked hard to preserve the historical legacy and accuracy and authenticity of- now, I, I wouldn't have forgotten the name like that. Did you say Hannah? Hannah? Hannah Shana Hayes. Like yeah. Hannah what yeah. was it? Just call her Shana, Shana Hayes. She's a Native American. She's one of the early- uh, Yeah, that's the, that's the short version of her name. She's a Native American and she worked tirelessly with us in the community from 2007 on to try to designate and save this historic community that needs a documentary done, that needs a digital tour done, that needs a cutting edge book done, because this is on the brain power of Harry O. Wilson, who was brilliant. Now, you mentioned Harry O. Wilson. Yes. Who was first, Harry O. Wilson or Tom Smith? Okay, they're, they're, uh, Tom Smith is first, but Tom Smith is in a different arena, okay? You with me? Was it in the same? Okay. Well, what I, okay. I I'll set I set the table for you. Tom Smith was a owner and operator of a hotel. Okay, in the four hundred block of Druid Hill. It's been demolished. Okay, he also with his brother Wallace controlled Baltimore. He was known as the Black Mayor. He had the white police department in the palm of his hand. He had the white city council in the palm of his hand. He was a philanthropist. He, he, he and his brothers owned part of a Negro League team. He was known up and down the Eastern seaboard, okay? How come we didn't learn about this in Baltimore City Public Schools, well, let we, alone Coppin State, Morgan State, we, 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 State, John Hopkins? I bet we, I've taken classes at all of these institutions. Well, and I've never heard of one of them talk about Tom Smith. Because you don't have this book, Old West Baltimore, that came out in oh, I can, Where can I get that book? Online, Amazon, or at Arcadia Publishing. We don't have let me, any. Let me see how thick the book is. It, it's not thick, bro. Come on. Now it has like 120 some pages. But this is where you learn a little bit about Tom Smith. Um, you learn a little bit about some pioneering Black Wall Street related folk that you don't know about. I spent the last 20 of my 30 years developing. Um, the sustainability of Old West Baltimore. I We have original content with research looking at sustainable black businesses that we need to know about. Well, isn't what you're doing racist? I mean, you're doing West Baltimore and you ain't doing East Baltimore. Well, no, it's not racist, but West Baltimore in 2004 Are was- Are you being Are you being uh, bougie? No, first of all, I don't you like the word- P.M. Smith told me, P.M. Smith told me that East Baltimore was blue collar and West Baltimore were, were the educated black people. I like to hear that ain't, that's not necessarily so. Well, to a degree it is, but it's not because you got to look at Dunbar. Dunbar produced some quality people, okay? It's not just Reginald F. Lewis and Judge Robert Bell and Richard McCoy and Jim Davenport and so forth. But Dunbar has an illustrious history. We could talk about it another time, but I want to answer your well, question. You, I'm a Dunbar poet. I want to hear some now. 
No, bro, because I don't want to talk about Dunbar right now. Okay, another time. Bring me back and we can talk about East Side. You know the phrase. Nobody you heard wants to interview you next. You should see all these damn comments he left who, over here. Who, who? Who? I didn't hear you. Michael Haney. He he he's he's clearly wants to bring you on his show. I don't he's even pretty, know. I don't even know who Michael Haney is, but I'm. He a, knows who you are because he watches this show. But he's pretty much telling me to shut up. He does a show on our network. Okay, so well, I, you know, it is your show, so it would be nice if you let me, let me give you a quick story. Back in the day when I was a neophyte. I learned how to get in when you fit in because Kathy Hughes used to talk over me on the radio show when I go on frequently. Tavis Smiley talked over me. So I got to the point where I said, you know what? I'm going to get in right away and I can run my mouth because I get tired of being on shows where I can't talk. Why have me on if I can't do what we do, right? Right? That's not a fair question because you're not fully analyzing what's going on. We're okay. trying to get information out of you I, Although a, you have it in your mind where you want to go, <laughs> but you got to remember, we don't know this stuff like you, and we need you to exactly. My bad, I, I agree, I agree. So, so let, let me back up for a minute, okay? The East Side obviously has a back. resplendent heritage because its geographic location next to the water, okay? So, the you East put me I, off my own show. I don't even like you. You go ahead and talk, I'll just wait. <laughs> you know what? I'm, you know what? What would you like for me to say? Okay, how about if I put in a plug for something that I'm going to drop on your show that a lot of people will be excited about? Um, my agent, Past Preservers, just sent me good news this week. The show that I'm on just went to a second season, and uh, I will be appearing on it in season two. You got attention deficit disorder as bad as me? No, bro. I just love what I do, man. It's passion. This is a gift. I was put here on earth to do this kind of work. So um, I don't need caffeine. I don't need vitamins. I just, the ancestors guide me and fuel me. And this is what we do. Okay. Yeah. He's pretty much saying that he won't interrupt you. So he wants to have you on his show. <laughs> okay. Well, but well, I'm not sure about that, but anyway, but, but check this out. What I love about Baltimore East side is that East side is That's being where we started. Right. 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 Yeah. And East side does not get the play that it deserves because People haven't focused on it. The West Side in 2004 was designated as a National Historic District. And, and they didn't do that for East Baltimore? No, but hear me out. No, they did not. No, they did not. N-O. That, that's ass backwards. Okay, but I can't. You know what? I, I can't control that narrative. The only narrative I can control is the ability to save primary source collections. Well, you research. fall right into it because your book is named Old West Baltimore. Well, but guess what, bro? I also own a domain name tied into East Baltimore history. So down the road, we might drop something on Black East Baltimore. All right? Listen. You listen. did what made sense at the time. There was more that you had at your disposal for West Baltimore, maybe, than you had at East Baltimore at the time. I mean, you no, go no. where the money's at. Where the no, no, no. I, I rep West Baltimore. I'm from Sandtown, from 1307 North Stockton Street, okay? So I will always be more into the place that helped to make my family. How do we know you from Sandtown? How do we know you just saying? I, I don't care what you think, bro. It's documented. I got pictures. We, we, we got oral history. We got artifacts. I got pictures of my family in front of the house in 1307 North Stockton Street. But anyway, I don't even want to go there. I, I'm, I'm going to drop some real knowledge on you for a minute, okay? West Baltimore in 2004 was designated a National Historic District. Those 175 blocks are proverbial who's who in Black America, okay? When I travel to give talks and projects around the country, people don't even know West, West Baltimore exists. So how do you think they're going to know about East Baltimore? They don't. They look at it as Baltimore. I know. They, and they, they don't understand us separating the two. It was separated for tax credits and development to help the developers. The five neighborhoods that are in, in this 175 block radius, you got Marcus Garvey coming to Baltimore frequently. You have Samuel Coleridge Taylor of Hiawatha Music fame. You have uh, Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, Mary, Mathal, Mary McLeod Bethune, Alelia Walker, the daughter of Madam C.J. Walker. You have the proverbial who's who in black America visiting, worshiping, playing, and having dinner and meetings all throughout those houses. Where was West Baltimore? Was it 
my dad said there was a time we could not live above North Avenue, west of Fulton Avenue. That's correct. That's correct. And see, I, I, I didn't get to meet your dad, but I was trying to do something to surprise you for this session this morning because you said that he owned his funeral home. The last iteration of his funeral home was Charles R. Law. And, and we have some of Law's funeral stuff that I was going to surprise you to hold up, but I couldn't quickly pull it out this morning. I'll never forget that funeral home. They were the, the well, and no, I, come on, no, no, but that's, that's, that's important because yesterday's post on social media, we honored Helen Holland. If you can pull it up, Helen Holland was in the 1600 block of Druid Hill Avenue. When her husband, George Holland, died, his wife stepped up to the plate. And for decades, she was one of the leading mortuary scientists in the area. I've heard him mention Katie Williams as a dynamic woman undertaker and leader. Right. Clarence and Katie Williams on Schroeder Street, they were, and they're interred in Mount Auburn Cemetery. But Helen Holland did it once her husband died and she funeral they funeralized over 50,000 bodies. So and this is a unique industry where you have to have that license, but if the funeral director, quite often a man, if he died, his wife or the spouse, better put, could could take over. Now they couldn't embalm technically, but they could certainly carry on the business. And, and so big ups to the funeral directors. I come out of that industry you know, yeah, I and that's, like, that's why I wanted to segue to this because I wanted to give props to your, your father in, in this important industry. Helen Holland actually was licensed because we have her original 1926 license from the state of Maryland. <laughs> Helen Holland mentored Nutter. Oh, well, that's a baby. I thought you had kidnapped some animals or something, Philip. Isabella, come here. I have a beautiful two-year-old daughter who's normally in all of our work, but I was trying to keep her away. Um, she, no, she, man, we want to see the babies. They Isabella, know bring, bring it. It, Isabella goes to the historic funeral cemeteries with us. She's normally out working with us. Veronica. Veronica! I'm trying to get her. Anyway, but I want to go back to Helen Holland. Most people know of Nutter's funeral home on Gwen Falls Parkway by Mondam and by Coppin and so forth. Okay? Nutter would not be Nutter if it wasn't for the legacy. The it used that, to be there. Okay, well, I don't live in Baltimore. Where's it now? Ooh. Because okay. that's all Coppin there. That's Coppin's gymnasium. Okay, thank you. Because, again, I don't live. Okay, but, but not her funeral home. I don't years. know. I don't okay. know the answer to that. Forgive me. I want to say Bryce is down road. Okay, well, Nutter comes out of the Maybe camp of, Chapman House, of Henry Hall, of, of Helen Holland. Okay. There, there's a legacy of the all the funeral homes are connected where you can see where each one was mentored and apprenticed by another one. Okay. Hi, Isabella. Isabella. <laughs> She's trying Hello, to Hello, Isabella. Hello, Mrs. Merrill. Okay. Hello. Can you put your face in the place quickly? Um, uh, I can't reach over to yeah, Come on, I want to see. Do you want to see your mom? Hello. <laughs> Ma'am, Mrs. Merrill, we want you to know that compensation is available for you. <laughs> There's a Merrill fund. Okay, come on. Bro. Okay, so so but 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 seriously, so before um I, I want to quickly talk about um, Helen Holland again. I, I wanted to mention this. I tried to briefly interview uh, Rusk, a Rusk funeral home on North West North Avenue. He's gone too. Yeah, he's gone, gone too. It's renamed. Okay, okay, but so he owned he owned a whole block, which is phenomenal. Okay, he Half talked a block. pretty much. Okay, him. maybe he did own the whole block, so and, and it's an elementary about. school at the end of it on the right. east end. Excuse me, please. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Excuse me, come, please. I've got to be seen. Wait a minute. This is the big boss. I'm getting all this flack. Good morning, Donnie. <laughs> the Praise the Lord. How are you doing today? The patient goes to the tap room, the mother who is responsible for all of this. So make the checks out to me. What's your name? <laughs> Donnie Glover. She, she she's one of the early graduates of Coppin. I mean, of of, 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 Western. of Western when they integrated with Brown v. Board. So you she got Coppin. Did you know Coppin's Sandtown roots? That's right. That do right. you know Coppin's Sandtown roots? Yes. Uh, Donnie, not only do I know it, we got some of the earliest Coppin history. The the library, Dr. Mary Wands, that tells people to go to Nanny Jack when they want to come up with the original early history. Who are you talking to? Who are you talking to? When you're doing other things, what do you think I'm doing? So you like the Indiana Jones of the black community. We also own a domain name called NegroHistoryDetective.com, okay? And 
I took that name because I have a collection from a pioneering brother in New York who in the early 60s was going out researching and trying to put uh, plaques on historic black sites in Manhattan, New York. In the early 1960s, he identified himself as the Negro history detective. He also self-published a book that was picked up and he has a curriculum enhancement, which we have all of. And so I've been trying to uplift his legacy by traveling around doing Negro history detective work. So yes, yes. Now, but can I hit you with one other good thing? One other good thing. The most important thing that I want people to leave with is this, okay? Your history is everywhere. It's in your garage, it's in your attic, it's in your bedroom, it's in a plastic box, it's in a paper box. You have to first be connected to your family history. And the, the most minute or boring aspect that you think of your family's history is today important, okay? If they were an early laborer and they worked for the Chesapeake Marine Railway dry dock, if they worked at Beth Steele, if they were the custodian at the Colored High School, if they worked at Ideal Federal Savings and Loan. I mean, I mean, there's just so much meat on the bones that we could eat from that we're not eating from. So don't think that everyone has to be in high cotton and has to be elite like the Du Bois Circle or like the Talented Tenth. We need to learn more about the everyday experiences of Black folk that did extraordinary things. So true. And you can get you have one last shout out for you. Hey, I'm I'm falling back. You're not going to talk about me. Okay. Well, well, well Michael Haney's going to talk about you anyway. So, um, when you think of Sugar Hill, what comes to mind? Well. I'll be honest. Initially, the first Sugar Hill I heard about was New York and the movie. Okay. I didn't realize the Sugar Hill in Baltimore on Druid Hill Avenue. And I'm thinking Druid Hill and Whitelock, if I'm not mistaken. That's part of it. It's also McCullough Street. Right. And that's where I get confused because no one's ever connected. Those are two different places. Right. So, so what, what, we are quietly, not quietly, because I'm saying it on your show. For I don't know how many people watching this, but I hope more than five are. But uh, anyway, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop something that the public has never heard, okay? This musician lived at 2439 Druid Hill Avenue. Let me repeat it. 2439 Druid Hill Avenue. And we have lyrics that she penned in the 50s for music that she performed around town in East Baltimore and on Pennsylvania Avenue. This song was called Free Boogie, okay? And this is the kind of collections that we now have. Was free Boogie about free and Boogie because Boogie was locked up? Was it <laughs> Free Boogie as in a free dance? I mean, because even in the heroin community, Boogie is a synonym for dope. Right. What um, is she talking about? Right. <laughs> you know, I love you, Donnie. You know, I think we have great chemistry, synergy. We got to we got to figure out how to work together on the regular because I love I love how you flow. OK. And I hope you love how I flow. OK. Because I'm not always punching you and I'm not trying to take over your show. I'm only going to read you one phrase of this. OK. Man, I done fell back. I didn't gave you I didn't gave you cut blunts. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. She was a part of a group. She She was connected to a group called Pee Wee Wooden, W-O-O-D-E-N, and his quartet. And they they go into different iterations. And they play everywhere from the Little Little Willie's Inn, which is right there um, in Sugar Hill on Druid Hill. They play, you know, at, at, at uh, oh, my gosh, at, at uh, wow, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Where else do they play? The Avenue Cafe, the Comedy Club, there in East Baltimore. So this is a group in the 50s that we can actually follow because we have their content. And I'm just gonna read you one phrase that I think is really kind of fascinating here. Um, it's, it's about a man and the relationship is ending. So she's free now. Um, and she says, uh, <clears throat> I sing goodbye, baby. Thanks for the memories. It's been good to know you, but it's better to be free. <laughs> okay, <laughs> um, uh, That's all right, baby. I'm free, I'm free at last. So she, she's really <clears throat> discussing this relationship through her, these words to her song and she entitles it Free Boogie. And she lived right there in the heart of Sugar Hill, which needs to be designated, needs to be researched, and needs to be put into 
the proper context that it deserves as a significant community for people of African descent. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Did I lose you? <laughs> Did I lose you? I wanted to ask you. Sure. Where can people go to learn more information? Where Where do you want people to focus on? What's <clears throat> next? Um, they can go to our website, nannyjack.com. Let's Let's get that up on the screen. <clears throat> Everybody wants to to get to you, Nanny N A N N Y J A C K dot com. Now, when I hear Nanny, the first person I think of is Nanny the Maroon Queen in Jamaica. Okay, when I hear Nanny, the first person I think of is my great-grandmother because she helped to raise us. Okay. Well, with all due respect to your great-grandmother, <laughs> Nanny the Maroon Queen might have whipped her butt because Nanny was, she had the machete. Did your grandma have a machete? Uh, yes, and a gun, and she, uh, I'm going to tell you a bad story. Well, that, that, it might have been a knockdown, drag-out fight. Right, right, because she did not play. Uh, uh, Fiddlin' Jackson, uh, who I'm named after, his name was Philip. Your uh, name is Fiddlin? Yeah, he was a bad man. He always had three things with him. He had a, uh illegal bottle of moonshine. Was a fiddling? I'm going to tell you, bro. I'm going to tell you. He Dude, had they called you Chidlin on the slide? <laughs> no, no, they didn't call me. I'm named Philip. His name was Philip, so I'm named after him. <laughs> but his name, they called him Fiddlin' Jackson, okay? His name was oh, they Phil didn't call you Fiddlin'. Oh, no, no, no. I've been called all kinds of things, but not that, okay? <laughs> okay. That sounds a lot like chiddling. I mean, what you rhyme fiddling with? <laughs> no. Fiddling chiddlings. No. You so, better not say that around them people, them culture vultures down Lexington Market that's selling hog maws and chiverings. Okay, well, guess what? Do you even know how to spell? Do you know how to spell chitterlings? Because most people don't. Because C -A -T -T -E -R -L -I -N -G. Okay, that's great. Okay, you get you get a, a gold star. So Fiddlin' Jackson had three things: his shotgun, moonshine, and his guitar or or or, or fiddle. That's where his name comes from. Okay, I got a deep question. Okay, go go ahead. So one day, he was a bad man. You know, he shot up the house and did all these horrific things. And one day, Nanny Jack had to call the police. And the police said, well, if you don't sleep with me, I'm going to arrest you. So she said, okay, take me to jail. This is showing you that this was a strong-willed, determined woman. She did not play. People in the community knew that it was a safe house in Sandtown. If you're in trouble, she helped you. If you need to so be knocked out. That's a good segue. Wait, wait go we, ahead. We didn't even touch the fact that Baltimore had the largest population of free blacks prior to the Civil War. Right. And see, we can't talk, we can't be all over the board in a, how long is your show? It's about to end. We can't you, got be six, you got six and a half minutes. Okay, we can't be all over the board. We just need to have a special segment that we just look at uh, antebellum Baltimore. See, you could have answered the question in that time. Okay. What was popular about Baltimore? Because you used the term mentioning grandma about nanny, about Baltimore being a safe haven. This is the this is the last southern state, the last southern city. What was it? What is it about Baltimore? And then tell me why I got to be fighting white people in bike lanes in 2022. I, I, I can't because I don't live in Baltimore. I don't, I don't fight bike lanes in Charlotte where I live. Um, okay, one thing at a time. <clears throat> when you look at the geographic location of Baltimore, you have the water. The water is a gateway to everything, okay? The economy, to uh, enslave vessels that are shipping out our people from various ports of entry down in Fells Point. Years ago with Ralph Clayton, we partnered to do a slave traders tour. And you probably didn't know anything about that at the time. I knew about but, the penitentiary was a slave pen. Okay, we ain't talking about that right now. We're talking about original sites that you can still go down to some of them in Fells Point. Of course, there are no markers there because Baltimore, the city, has not done right by its illustrious black history. There should be designated markers throughout signage so local folks, school children, visitors can walk and understand the sacred ground of what they, where they're walking on. So Baltimore, because of geographic location, is a gold mine for slave traders. 
Okay, there's a whole bunch of connectivity to uh, Lumpkins Jail in Richmond, to Alexandria, Virginia, to Charleston, South Carolina, to um, New Orleans. Uh, there was a prominent slave jail on Pratt Street that everybody talks about, okay? But that's another conversation. Baltimore had a magnificent freeborn population that were working. And I need to say that they worked. They, they were artisans. They, they were silversmiths. They were blacksmiths. They were coppersmiths. They owned businesses. They were tobacconists. I've been researching this free black man for decades. Um, he kept an ad in the directories. Why don't we know about all these freeborn black people and what they did, where they lived, uh, what church they belonged to, what benevolent society? So this is the kind I of- I want to know how free black people stay free Okay, no, that's a great got brothers down the road who are enslaved. How did that well, work? Okay, well, the, another time I'll show you what is known as a certificate of freedom. Okay, this is a document that is ready to have a pass. Right, this, and we have an original one. They, they rare. It's the creme de la creme of what I call slave paper. Did it's white people have slave papers? Were white people slaves? Were they indentured servants? Well, yeah, they, they were. They were. But, but we're How not. We don't talk about them. Well, because that's not what my, my expertise and my focus is. I try to stay in my lane, which is African And on that note, yeah, black people own slaves too. Yeah, and not only that, but some black people, from a humanity perspective, if a black person could um, become an enslaver, they also could become an uh, emancipator. So if if I own Donnie Glover, I may have saved you I don't from- even like the sound of that shit. Okay, Dan. <laughs> but if I owned, if I enslaved Donnie Glover, no, I, I don't like the sound of that. You find okay. another way of saying it. Okay, if I enslave, <laughs> if you uh, own Donald Trump, how about that? No, no, I, no, I, I would go to jail because I would, I would have to take him out. But anyway, so if I owned another person of African descent, I may find a way to legally emancipate them so they can be free. Okay, now with with Baltimore, these people in, kill me like they got the right to own somebody. They got little rules, right, and right, a code. Right. These right. something, they, you know what? Yeah, come on over and try to own something. Okay, come okay. Yeah. You, you see, you're, you're gonna make the diabolical side. I've tried to repress this for years. Tony, 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 Tony. I just want to hit you with something that's really that's really fascinating. Um, we don't know our history, therefore we don't know ourselves. And white people don't know their history either. No, they don't. But we've been given by them through their lens who we should. Yeah. And so who somebody who, that don't know their self gonna tell you who you are. So think what, about that. What we have done for 30 years is try to get people in touch with knowing their own history, knowing their own history. Okay. And with that said, it's really important to get past the regular heroes that they have given us. Oh, you mean Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks? I love them, but there's so many other people. And in my new book that's coming out next year called Baltimore and the Civil Rights Movement, published by Arcadia Publishing, we're going to drop some new knowledge on looking at Baltimore's civil rights activities. Well, we got to wait till next year. Well, because I'm not finished yet because I'm doing 16,000 other things like being on your show. Can I drop another site that people can find us on, please? You got an attitude with me or something? I do something to you. I'm just asking a question. And I'm answering, brother. I, 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 yeah, I, I, little, you got to put that little baby up there. She softens the flow <laughs> a little bit. Um, um, thank you. Um, can they go to oldwestbaltimore.com? How many websites you got? Am I getting my, who am I sending this invoice to? You know what? When we partner for some projects that we're talking oh, about off we air, go. that's when go. you get paid, okay? It's called oldwestbaltimore.com. Man, I love history. You know I'm going to put it out there because I, I want people it. to know. We and I love need what to you, know. I love and what you're doing, and I love that you're helping us, and we can work together, two black men, professionals. The other one I want you to follow is Artifactual Journey on um, all, pla all podcast platform, uh, platforms. Um, Apple, Anchor, Spotify, you can listen to our podcast that delves into topics just like we're talking about today. They start off with an artifact, and then we segue to the guest, um, and we go deep around the country, around the world. Good deal. Okay. <laughs> Anything else you want to add? Yeah. Um, please continue to watch the reruns of the Antiques Roadshow on PBS, where you see me with hair 20 years ago. I was a pioneer on that uh, hit show. And you can watch me on reruns on the Chesapeake Collectibles, where I was for eight years with hair and without hair on Maryland Public Television, PBS. Good deal. Thank you very much, Mr. Philip. Now, who, who was that lady? That was your mom? Betty and my and wife, wife, Veronica. Yes. Veronica. Betty and, and Veronica. 
and my daughter Isabella. Isabella, are you Spanish? Is Latino? Do I look Spanish to you, brother? What does that look like? I mean, because <laughs> I don't even know how to say that no more. I know, I know, I know. I said that to you. This month, but I put Hispanic on a YouTube video, and the Latinos start beating up. I ain't no damn Hispanic. It's like. <laughs> Hold up, wait, man, wait, man. Okay, okay, but that's like a black man being called colored. I get it, but I ain't know. And then okay. some of y'all want to be called Latinx. Make I, your damn mind up. I, I guess that's how they feel about black people colored, black, black African American, African -American Negro. Exactly. Negro, exactly. As I leave, let's Woo! all let's all celebrate International Underground Railroad Month. Twelve different states across the country are recognizing September as International Underground Railroad Month. I'm out. Peace. My name is Donnie Glover. Thank you, Mr. Philip Merrill, for joining us. OldWestBaltimore.com, NannyJack.com, so much more. We're proud of you, Philip. We thank, thank you. And big ups also, again, to Diane Bell McCoy for making sure we play well in the sandbox <laughs> together. My name is Donnie Glover, and have a great day. <laughs>